Welcome to the Consulting Specifying Engineer webcast, Critical Power Backup Power Systems, sponsored by ASCO. I'm your moderator, Jack Smith, with Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media. Now here's some tips for today's webcast to ensure that you'll be getting the best possible experience. If you're having trouble with your slides or your audio, refresh your browser or click the Refresh Media button directly under the presenter's photo. You can control the volume settings of this webcast by adjusting the volume on your computer speakers. If you're having technical problems, click the question mark at the top right corner of your screen to bring up a list of system checks to try before contacting an online technician. If you do need a technician, type a message in the Ask a Question box and someone will respond as soon as possible in the Answered Questions box. Type questions for today's speakers in the Ask a Question box on the left side of your screen. The Q&A portion of uh, this webcast will start after the, after the prepared presentation, in a board, which is roughly about 45 minutes from now. If you are on Twitter, tweet your questions to us at hashtag CSE Backup Power. Today's webcast is being recorded, and you will receive an email with the link to the archive in about a week. To download the presentation slides, use event resources on the left side of your screen. Now we will uh, hear from three of today's sponsors, ASCO, Load banks are a vital component for every backup power system because they provide necessary and accurate power loading to ensure the reliability of your power. That's why facility executives and other professionals need the most dependable load bank solutions. The combination of ASCO, Avtron, and Froment connects all the pieces so your facilities always have power. The combination of unparalleled experience, leading edge technologies, and the most responsive global support in the industry are complemented by the broadest load bank portfolio that can be integrated with Sigma load bank controls. To learn more and download a load bank white paper, visit our website or call 800-800-ASCO. For those of you who are interested in receiving learning unit credit for this event, you need to pass a 10 question exam to take the learning unit exam and to download your AIA CES certificate Use the Learning Unit Exam tab option at the top of your screen. The exam will open in a new browser window, and you can complete the exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website with the on-demand version of this webcast. In keeping with the American Institute of Architects, continuing education system policy, please take a few moments to read the quality assurance slide. And here is a list of learning objectives for today's webcast, and we'll cover these in today's presentation. Now let's meet today's presenters, Douglas Lacey and Tom Devine. Douglas Lacey is the Vice President for WSP CCRD with 16 years of experience in the consulting engineering field. He currently serves as an electrical, electrical group manager in the Dallas office. He has been involved in the design, planning, and construction of various commercial and healthcare projects. Doug specializes in the design of critical power systems, UPS systems, medium voltage distribution, and campus central utility distribution plants. Tom Devine is Senior Electrical Engineer at Smith Seckman Reed in Houston and has spent 16 years in the consulting engineering field with the past 12 years designing and engineering healthcare facilities. He is responsible for power, lighting, and fire 
alarm design for hospital and healthcare projects, and he has written many technical articles and is a veteran webcast presenter. Tom is currently a member of the Consulting Specifying Engineer Editorial Advisory Board. And now, Doug will begin our presentation. Good afternoon. Today we're going to start with codes and standards that are applicable to the design of critical power backup systems. Some of the key things that we need to look at when we're first endeavoring to design a critical backup system is first we need to understand the occupancy type and classification of the project that we're involved in. The differences in the codes related to things such as whether the building is high rise or has an assembly occupancy, has hazardous locations, or is an institutional occupancy such as healthcare or a prison are key things to understand as we go through the codes and standards and will direct us on what is necessary for us to provide in our buildings. Since most of the projects in the United States are permitted under a model code that is based on the International Code Council, that's probably the first place that we need to look at for some guidance as to whether or not a critical uh, standby system is going to be required. Once that information is known, then we also need to make sure that we're complying with different standards and codes that may be adopted by your local municipalities or governing agencies. Those agencies could include different federal agencies, such as military projects, uh, could involve state offices, local cities, or licensing boards for institutions such as hospitals, daycares, and so forth. When we look to the NFPA codes and standards, some of the key codes that we need to review during our initial design phases, of course, are the NFPA 70, the National Electrical Code, which has many of the requirements on the how and where of emergency power throughout the building. In addition, NFPA also issues other standards that relate to critical backup systems, such as NFPA 99, which will give details about healthcare facilities and is correlated with information that's also provided in the NEC. For the life safety code for projects that have adopted the NFPA 101 life safety code, that, that code has different requirements from the IBC and should take special note for projects that are permitted or reviewed by state and federal governments as they many times adopt NFPA 101, even if the local city has not adopted it. NFPA 110, the standard for emergency and standby power systems, has many of the installation and timing requirements necessary for the different levels of standby systems and should be referred to during the design. Uh, not mentioned here on this slide, but another possible NFPA code or standard that may be enforced would be NFPA 5000, which is the model building code from the NFPA organization in the absence of an IBC code. When we look into the NEC, applicable articles for your design would include the, those listed on the screen. For the generator installation itself, Article 4.5 is where you'll find the information necessary uh, for the ratings and the design of the generator and its, and its accessories. Article 700, 701, and 702, which we'll spend quite a bit of time today discussing later in the presentation, outline the different requirements for emergency, legally required, and optional standby systems, and knowing which systems are required in which building types and occupancies is key. Article 705 for the interconnected electrical power production sources will be applicable if you're connecting to uh, photovoltaics or other uh, standby systems that uh, you may be using in your facility. Article 708, the uh, Critical Operations Power System, or COPS, is another uh, specific type of uh, standby system that Tom will discuss at length as we move forward. There are some common articles um, with special applications that you'll find in the NEC that we'll refer to uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, Article uh, 517 uh, for healthcare facilities is correlated with the NFPA 99 requirements, and we'll spend 
uh, some length talking about how critical backup systems are applied in healthcare. NEC Article 695, in, in conjunction with NFPA Standard 20, uh, talks about how the uh, critical backup system or standby system would be used in conjunction with the uh, fire pump for uh, fire protection of your facility. With that, Tom will take us through standby and emergency systems. Thanks, Doug. Uh, chapter 7 of the NEC shows the requirements for three different kinds of standby systems that are generally applicable, and those will be emergency systems, as described in Article 700, legally required standby, as in Article 701, and optional standby in Article 702. I'm going to talk right now about emergency 700 loads and uh, 701 loads. And I'll use this one-line diagram. This is a one-line diagram of a hypothetical facility. Uh, it doesn't correspond to anything real. It shows uh, legally required standby in yellow or orange. It shows uh, emergency in red. Optional is in green. COPS is in blue. And at the far right is uh, just some normal stuff that we really won't be looking at further. So talking about the emergency system, and of the three common most standby, the most common standby systems, the emergency has the highest priority, and its purpose is primarily to protect people's lives. Uh, we've got a little snippet of our one-line diagram on the right. Uh, it's expanded a bit, and it shows the normal and emergency feeds to the transfer switch and a couple of levels of distribution. Emergency systems are, as defined in the code, systems that are required by a law or code and they're specially classed as emergency systems in that code, or they're classed that way by an AHJ, an authority having jurisdiction. Emergency systems provide power that's essential for, human, for the protection of human life, and the favorite example of emergency loads might be egress lighting. Uh, this lighting that illuminates a path to the outside of the building when uh, normal power source is not available. Some other emergency loads are uh, fire alarm or communication systems that are used to communicate with emergency services like the fire department or that are used to provide emergency instructions to occupants. Also industrial processes that can't be shut down unexpectedly without some danger to people. Some systems that we might intuitively consider as emergency loads aren't in fact served by a code designated emergency system. Note that uh, smoke removal systems in particular are not on the list of emergency loads. They will be listed as legally required standby. Now here are some of the requirements for emergency systems. This list covers some of the, some of the maybe the more interesting requirements. If we try to do an exhaustive description of the, all the requirements for an emergency system, we would, we would not be able to finish it in this hour. The capacity of the emergency system, and most of the time that would be the minimum compliant capacity of the generator has to be enough to operate all the loads connected to it simultaneously. And this is a very stringent requirement for a generator because it's unlikely that the system will ever have all the loads running at the same time. Nevertheless, the nature of the emergency system calls for it to uh, be prepared to, for whatever is asked of it at any time, and hence this requirement. Transfers to the, to the emergency system have to be automatic, so they call for automatic transfer switches. There's a 10-second rule that says within 10 seconds of the loss of normal power, the emergency system will apply power to the load terminals of its transfer switches. So there's a, that's a 10-second rule. There's also a requirement for selective coordination. That's in Article 700.28. It requires that the emergency system overcurrent devices, quote, be selectively coordinated with all supply-side overcurrent protective devices. Uh, this requirement first showed up in the 2008 edition, and it's led to a lot of discussion ever since it appeared. The 2014 edition amped up the definition of selective coordination in Article 100 uh, to the point of requiring full selective coordination for all overcurrent devices in the emergency system for all possible levels of overcurrent and all possible device opening times. It looks like the impetus for this requirement is generally theoretical because there were no documented events of death or serious injury that resulted from a failure of selective coordination. 
Then later on, we'll look at how this requirement gets modified for healthcare systems in NFPA 99 and in um, Article 517. Article 700 also allows us to use a single generator or generator system to serve the emergency system along with other loads. If it does serve other loads, Article 700 says that it has to have automatic load shed to preferentially keep power on to the emergency loads at the expense of the other standby loads. On the emergency system, every panel at every voltage level must have surge protection. We'll see a similar requirement for critical operations power systems later on, but we won't find it among the requirements for legally required standby or for optional systems. Emergency wiring has to be kept independent of all other wiring. It can't occupy the same raceway or wireway or enclosures with anything else except where it's absolutely necessary, and exceptions might be uh, generally for enclosures of transfer equipment like transfer switches where I have to bring normal power and emergency power or generator power at least into um, a single enclosure so that they can each be inputs to the transfer switch. 700.10 also says that wiring from the generator to the emergency system has to be separate from all other wiring, but it allows an exception for systems that serve the emergency transfer switches from separate vertical sections or from separate disconnects. The diagram on the right shows the generator feed from our hypothetical drawing. It has a single conductor from the generator to the standby system wireway with separate disconnects serving each of the uh, four components in the system, and in particular, a separate disconnect for the emergency system. The requirement first showed up in the 2008 edition. Uh, it's not retroactively enforced, but it does apply to additions to existing systems, typically. So it can be impossible to add a breaker to an existing switchboard to serve, say, an optional load from some vertical section when that section has any component of the emergency system in it. Article 700.10D11 requires some form of fire protection for the emergency system in a high-rise building or with a large or in a large assembly occupancy. Um, options are listed circuit protective systems, fire barriers, concrete encasement, and fire sprinklers. Note that there's a bit of an erratum here that I say on the slide 700.8D, the correct reference is 710. This requirement um, for fire protection has evolved considerably over the last few editions of the NEC. In 2002, it only covered specific occupancies, and in particular, institutional, which would cover hospitals, was not on that list. One way to comply was to be in a fully sprinklered building, uh, but in 2005, the change, requirement changed from be in a fully sprinklered building to be in spaces or areas protected by an approved automatic fire suppression system. In that same edition of the handbook, warned that spaces above ceilings aren't normally protected by the sprinkler system. That was uh, unexpected. And then in 2008, the handbook dropped that warning and said that circuits installed in a fully sprinkler building are generally adequately protected and nothing further need be done. In 2014, they listed, deleted the list of affected occupancies, so the requirement applies to all occupancies. And the warning about space above ceilings came back in the handbook. So it's not clear what is really required for above ceiling installations. The handbook isn't enforceable as code, but its provisions carry a lot of weight with an AHJ, and so it's certainly possible that a requirement for additional fire protection for circuits above ceilings could be enforced. That might be in the, pro in the um, form of uh, fire enclosure, a fire rated feeder, or I've even seen um, installations of sprinkler systems above ceiling just to protect a big feeder. It's also worth noting that the 2015 edition of NFPA 95, which is the Healthcare Facilities Code, specifically states that these fire protection requirements don't apply in healthcare facilities, and it seems likely that the next edition of the NEC will cover will include something similar in Article 517, and that'll cover healthcare requirements. This exception continues a trend that we've seen in the last couple of code cycles in which Article 700 typically ratchets up requirements, and then the next edition of NFPA 99 exempts hospitals from those requirements. Now looking at legally required standby systems, the next uh, item in the big three hierarchy of standby systems. 
The requirements for these systems are described in Article 701 of the National Electrical Code. Here's our expanded diagram of the legally required standby. On the right, showing the normal feed, the transfer switch, and again, a couple of levels of distribution. We, you'll notice one thing, there's no uh, surge protection devices in these. We'll talk about that in a minute. Like emergency systems, legally required standby systems have to have, uh, are acquired and specifically classed as legally required standby by law and by the codes or by an AHJ. They provide power to selective loads other than emergency loads, and the loss of these loads could create a hazard to people or hamper rescue or firefighting efforts, but it doesn't rise to the level of threatening human life. Some examples are smoke removal systems from atriums, uh, sewage disposal systems whose loss could, of course, interfere with rescue efforts, and then heating and cooling systems. Now here are some of the requirements of legally required standby systems uh, along the lines of what we talked about for emergency systems a few minutes ago. The capacity of the generation system has to be enough to operate all of the loads that are intended to be operated simultaneously. This is less stringent than the requirement for emergency systems because in that this allows for some diversity among the loads that won't operate at the same time, like maybe heating and cooling of the same space, or like elevators who controls only allow just a one or two or a limited number of cars to operate at the same time. Like emergency systems, the transfer to standby generation has to be automatic. The timing rule is 60 seconds. It has to apply power to its load terminals of its transfer switches within 60 seconds after normal power fails. Uh, we also have a selective coordination rule. It's this exactly identical to the rule for uh, the emergency system very uh, stringent. And finally, Article 701, just like 700, allows us to use the same generator to serve higher priority emergency loads along with lower priority loads uh, from the sta for, with the same generator that serves legally required standby, provided that we have automatic load shed. It has to prioritize emergency loads top, followed by legally required standby, and then optional loads. And here is another erratum. Uh, that reference should be 701.42 rather than 701.4b. Okay, so legally required standby circuits are allowed to run in the same raceway and enclosure as general wiring. There's no requirement for separation like we had with emergency systems. There's also no requirement that legally required standby circuits occupy separate vertical sections or switchboards or switchgear to be able to be served from a single generator feeder. That requirement exists for emergency systems, but not for legally required standby. And there's no requirement for surge suppression. Article 701 uh, does require that we consider various hazards, including fire, to, uh, in the design of legally required standby, but it doesn't have any specific requirement for circuit fire protection. For healthcare, the legally required standby system typically is part of the equipment branch serving heating and medical air and vacuum, uh, certain exhaust fans, and some limited heating in places that get cold enough to cause hazards to patients in cold climates. There were a number of changes in the 2014 NEC that affect healthcare requirements for stand the standby power system, and we will talk about those a little bit later. Uh, however, recent changes have had a minimal effect on the treatment of legally required standby loads. Doug, back to you. So as we move down the hierarchy of systems, we get to optional standby systems. Um, these systems would include items that are not legally required and not an emergency. They aren't intended for the protection of human life or to assist in firefighting, but rather these are items that perhaps the project owner would desire to have on a backup power source in the event that the normal utility source were to fail or to be unavailable. Um, one of the things that you'll note here is the capacity for this equipment is for items that will be operated at one time. 
leaving a, a bit of a latitude into what the owner would define as operated at one time. So if you could prioritize even a subset of the optional standby systems, that would, that would allow you to put more devices on the standby system, provided they weren't going to be simultaneous or wouldn't affect the other systems that Tom mentioned before. So while it's permissible under the code to have the same generator source equipment, power, emergency systems, legally required systems, and optional standby systems, we need to have separate automatic transfer devices, and in this case for optional standby it could be a manual transfer device, that would allow for a prioritization of load. Um, optional standby can be a manual switch that would be manual initiated, and using those combined systems, we need to understand that the, that the load shed capability would need to be available to shed the optional loads in the, in the event of an emergency where you would only want the emergency systems or legally required systems to run, or if the generator capacity uh, were to begin to be overloaded, the system would be able to command these loads to go off first. We also need to understand how this affects selective coordination. Uh, making sure selective coordination would be making sure that the overcurrent device closest to the fault or or uh, power abnormality would be the would be the device that opens rather than letting a a device farther upstream open. While the code requires that selective coordination on the other two types of systems, it should be noted that one could interpret that if we're using a combined system that we would not want an overcurrent device on the optional standby branch of that system to inadvertently trip a breaker that would affect the emergency or legally required systems. So we, you would need to do your overcurrent coordination study to ensure that you had selective coordination at least down below the automatic transfer switch for the uh, optional system. And now back to Tom and he's going to talk about COPS. Thanks, Doug. Uh, Article 708 covers critical operations power systems, abbreviated COPS, and it first appeared in the 2008 NEC. Um, right around that time, we, recent events had pretty well highlighted certain vulnerabilities to natural disasters and to disasters intentionally initiated by people in the national electrical infrastructure. So 708 defines requirements for standby power systems that serve facilities that support critical functions. 708 describes critical power, excuse me, critical operations power systems as those that serve facilities that are essential for public safety, for emergency management, national security, or business continuity. Some examples might be fire stations and 9-11 call centers, uh, certain government buildings, and for business continuity that might refer to a stock exchange or a communication infrastructure facility. The COPS is normally designated by a governmental authority, or it may be defined by the laws or codes. And alternatively, a facility can declare itself to be a COPS based on its own internal document, doc, documentation. But being a COPS has a lot of requirements, and it doesn't really seem to provide a lot of benefits. It's difficult to think of why a facility might decide that it wants to be under Article 708's requirements, but nevertheless, the code makes a provision for it. It may be that there are some local regulations that would call for designated COPS to get priority in things like generator fuel or utility service restoration after a failure. If that's so, there could be some benefits, but those will not be defined in the NEC. They'll be defined outside of it. One of the key definitions in 708 is a designated critical operations area, abbreviated DCOA. A DCO is the location that houses and supports the critical operations. You could say that it's a facility or a piece of a facility that requires critical, a critical operations power system. Uh, examples of them are the same as some of, similar to what we've talked about. They could be air traffic control, more emergency call centers, some data processing centers, or some broadcast stations. The NEC does not make any effort to tell, decide what might be a DCOA. It leaves the designation of the DCOA to local authorities and instead describes the requirements for the installation of the COPS. And here are COPS requirements. 
the alternate source for a COPS, which is normally a generator, has to have enough capacity to serve all the loads that are operated simultaneously. But the code specifically states that the, the, this capacity applies to a varying load uh, and that the system has to be able to serve the loads indefinitely. The purpose of declaring the load, that the loads are variable is to allow a standby rated generation system to serve a COPS as opposed to having to have a prime rated or continuous rated system given the unlimited time requirement. Now that doesn't mean that the fuel has to be there for an unlimited time. That means that they would have to be, the generator can't require a shutdown or cool off period while it's running. Uh, obviously fuel would be, have to be delivered and staged uh, on a regular basis. And like emergency systems and legally required standby, the transfer to uh, the alternate source has to be automatic. Transfer time is not defined. It's listed as as required by the application. Uh, some things that might have for, for a business data center, that might mean fast enough to, for the UPS to, uh, to hold the load up during the transfer. For a fire station, it might be a few minutes. And for a detention facility, for a jail, where things can go wrong fast, that might just be a couple of seconds. Selective coordination is also required for a COPS, the same level of selective coordination that we see for requirements uh, for emergency and legally required standby. And if the source serves other systems besides the COPS, selective coordination, uh, selective pickup and load shed have to be available. And emergency and COPS are at the top of the list, but there's no distinction between them, followed by legally required standby and finally optional loads. The COPS has to have surge protection at all distribution voltage levels. That's a different requirement than the Article 700 requirement, which is suppression on all uh, panel boards and switch boards, et cetera. Depending on how the AHJ sees things, you could use a single 480 volt surge device at the service entrance and maybe cover the entire facility. Um, if 208, 120 volt panels only have utilization circuits without distribution at 208, then that would be a uh, there would only be the one distribution voltage level, and uh, it's worth taking the effort to check with an ASJ to see how this requirement will be enforced. The wiring of COPS can't occupy the same raceway or enclosures with other wiring, uh, just like emergency systems, with the usual exceptions for transfer switches and similar equipment. There's not a requirement for COPS circuits to originate in separate sections of vertical switch gear like there is for emergency circuits. And fire protection is required for all COPS feeders without any exceptions based on uh, the, whether or not the building is sprinklered. Um, they have to have one of, I think, three things, which would be a rated, a listed fire protection system, uh, some kind of thermal barrier, um, uh, and then the third one escapes me just now. So we'll take a quick look at healthcare, beginning with the 2012 edition of NFPA 99. Requirements for hospital systems started to diverge from uh, the requirements for emergency systems. We're not here to cover hospital systems in detail, but we will spend a minute or two talking about the code changes that affect healthcare. And prior to 2014, the life safety and critical branches of the hospital systems were defined in the NEC as the emergency system for a hospital, and they fell under the requirements of 700. Article 517, which covers healthcare facilities in the NEC, amended those requirements somewhat, but generally 700 covered both these branches. In 2014, the, NEC, the definition of emergency systems for hospitals was deleted from Article 517. Uh, and the three branches, life safety, critical, and equipment, are today considered just as the essential electrical system with no emergency system being defined. The rise in action for this uh, change seems to have been the requirement for selective coordination. Uh, every, every, uh, every edition of the NEC amps up the level of requirement for selective coordination since 2005. Now the writers of NFPA 99 take a different view of selective coordination and they see it as only one component of an appropriate overcurrent protection design and believe that too strong a commitment to selectivity could have a negative impact on other issues of the design, like the very protection function itself and on arc flash levels in the systems. So that, that uh, has been abrogated.
Let's see if I can get the right slide. So, NFPA 99 used to define the required level of, or excuse me, in, in the 2012 edition of NFPA 99, the required level of selective coordination uh, covered faults that persisted for a tenth of a second or longer, and it eliminates references to the emergency system. Um, that's very different from the Article 700 requirement, which is for all current overcurrent levels and for all device opening times. In, uh, in 2012 NFPA 99, it, the requirement went for only those faults that last longer than a tenth of a second. In the 2014 NEC, Article 517 was harmonized with the requirements of uh, NFPA 99, and it shows a similar tenth of a second rule. That's much less stringent, again, than the full range of over, available overcurrents and opening times. And 517 requires that the life safety branch, which powers a lot of the same things that the emergency system serves in a non-healthcare occupancy, falls under the requirements of 700 emergency systems, except for those requirements are specifically amended in 517. So the wiring method provisions of Article 700 apply to the life safety branch, but the requirements for selective coordination of Article 700, which are amended in 517, don't. So summarizing healthcare, hospitals no longer have an emergency system. The life safety system generally falls under 700, except where it's amended in 517. Now it's worth noting that AHJs may take a different view about whether the critical branch falls under Article 700 as well. The definition of an emergency system, which is those the system serving functions whose loss could present a danger to human life, that certainly applies at least to parts of the critical branch. So it's possible that an ASJ could declare the critical branch as a de facto emergency system and try to enforce those requirements. So it's worth uh, making the effort to determine from the ASJ how he sees the emergency system in hospitals. And Doug, back to you. All right, so now that we've covered uh, some of the different uh, subdivisions of the uh, standby power system, it's important to talk about the fuel that will be used to, uh, to feed the backup source. So one thing to note about fuel storage is there are many different fuel sources that are that are allowed uh, to be used by NFPA 110. Uh, those include uh, LP, natural gas, diesel, and gasoline. Um, NFPA 110 5.1 uh, gives us a discussion about whether or not a gaseous system can be used as a backup for a level one system, and it has an exception that that discusses whether or not there is a high probability of that system being able to support uh, the backup power source. So in different regions of the country, you would need to conduct a risk analysis to understand whether or not a natural gas pipeline system would be a system that could be used in a level one system. Um, Areas that are prone to earthquakes or disruption in pipeline uh, that would that would cut off the uh, natural gas source would be poor candidates for using natural gas for your your backup system. And a local AHJ, uh, based on different runtime requirements, may uh, require that you have either a biofuel solution uh, or a portion of your backup system be on another source such as diesel or a locally stored. Uh, LP gas container. Um, so the runtime requirements uh, vary based on occupancy type, and the state and local codes, as well as a seismic risk analysis, will uh, direct you as to what the total duration of runtime is required. Um, one thing to note here, um, I, there's been a lot of talk about demand response or uh, connecting your backup systems to be able to provide some sort of peak shaving. Uh, we could fill an entire another presentation on the EPA's restrictions for stationary standby runtimes and how that those would affect the uh, pollution control equipment on generator sets. Um, so we won't delve too much into that other than to know that there are hour limits in place throughout the country imp uh, imposed by the EPA. And when you exceed those requirements, you have to change uh, the type of filtration and uh, possibly 
change the uh, source type of your equipment to make sure you can have a, a cleaner burn. Uh, when we look at uh, fuel storage specifically uh, of the diesel variety uh, within buildings, there's a few uh, codes that we want to make sure that we take a look at. Uh, the International Building Code has guidelines on uh, the storage of uh, fuel within buildings and the maximum allowable capacities as does in FPA 5000. Uh, of note, uh, in FPA 110 Chapter 7.9.5.1 has a uh, limit of 660 gallons of diesel fuel or 25 gallons of gasoline that can be uh, within a building. Now, one thing to note is uh, if you go through and you, for instance, would maybe possibly need to store more than, than that in your building, there's a method through the IBC 307 which you can define uh, separate hazard zones and work with your AHJ on on ways in which to store larger fuel amounts, but with that come additional fire protection and containment requirements. Uh, different tank types that could be used for uh, the storage of the diesel fuel are defined uh, in NFPA 30 standard on flammable and combustible liquids, uh, as well as uh, relying on the UL code listings for the, most, the two most common uh, tank types, UL uh, 142 and UL 2085, and those those different UL listings have different attributes to the tanks, and many authorities having jurisdictions have local fuel oil code amendments that would drive you to one tank design or another based on what they believe the hazard is. So as we move on to load characteristics, a few things when you're sizing your uh, source equipment, you need to understand the effect that perhaps a uninterruptible power supply would have on your generator sizing. And uh, uh, sorry for the uh, mistranslation of the abbreviation there. Uh, when in the, <laughs> in the SCR that I'm talking about here, I'm talking more about uh, silicone controlled uh, rectifiers. When it comes to how they affect the automatic voltage regulation of your generator system, um, anytime you have a non-linear load, it creates notches in the sine wave, and that sine wave is what the AVR is trying to control. Thus, if you have a very distorted sine waveform based on uh, perhaps a low, a low number of pulse SCR rectifier, you're going to see overcorrection, undercorrection spikes from your generator, and it's going to always be goal-seeking on, on how to maintain voltage. Um, so when you talk about generators that are used for nonlinear loads, such as those in healthcare and data center applications, you need to make sure you have a, a generator source that's robust enough, it's large enough in capacity, and has an, an alternator that can handle those nonlinear loads. Most of this information is going to be found by looking at the prototype testing uh, of the generator and alternator combination, looking at um, the power factor contribution, uh, and basically working with different, your different generator manufacturers to understand which of their product lines are better suited for the load application, because it is not a one-size-fits-all market. Um, with regard to fire pumps, um, NEC, NEC Article uh, 695.7 uh, is states that the voltage cannot drop more than 15% uh, on the start of the uh, fire pump. Um, it cannot vary more than 5% while it's running. Um, so what this means is if you've already moved onto the, onto the generator, you need to make sure that you have uh, a generator that can take a 15, you know, not drop more than 15% voltage when that large motor starts. And so I know that can be an issue, and we can have another discussion about how to properly size gensets to avoid wet stacking, but it is one of your largest loads. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jack. Thank you, Doug, and thank you, Tom, for the first-rate presentation. A lot of information in there. And now our presenters will answer questions about the topic. So type your questions in the Ask a Question box uh, on your screen, and please indicate which speaker you would like to answer your question by typing his name before the question. If you are on Twitter, tweet your questions to hashtag CSE Backup Power. We will get to as many questions as time allows. 
So to take the kernel um, learning unit exam, to download your AIA learning unit certificate, use the learning unit exam tab option. On top of your screen, the exam will open in a new browser, and you can take the complete exam after the webcast. However, the link will break when the webcast signs off. The exam will be posted on the Consulting Specifying Engineer website at www.csemag.com with the on-demand version of this webcast. Now let's get to the questions. So, Tom, you get the first question, and it's uh, uh, at least three parts to it, so I can um, take it a little bit at a time or ask it all at once. But uh, the first part of this question is, when a genset is applied in NFPA 10, NFPA 110, level 1, type 10 applications, can the gen set be used to back up loads that are not considered life safety? And Jack, I didn't hear, is that to me, Tom? Yeah, that's Tom, yes. Okay, great. And the answer is yes, it can. I'm going to explain what those numbers mean. Uh, level 1 means that the generating system is in a facility where a failure of power, a total power failure, could result in loss of human life or serious injury. Um, type 10 means that it's, uh, it comes up within 10 seconds of the uh, loss of normal power. So this could be a hospital generating, uh, generating unit or generating, set, generating system. And uh, yes, it can be used to back up loads that are not considered life safety. In a non-hospital application, it could be a um, it could do it by having um, load shed that would prioritize life safety above all others. In a hospital application, it would um, you know I've done it without having load shed when I've had adequate generation or I've seen it done that way. Uh, normally, we do put in load shed as well, but they would hold up both the life safety and the critical branch at the expense of the equipment system, um, but it's possible to do it. Okay, that leads to the second part of this question. So if so, in typical applications where the genset is backing up both life safety and non-life safety loads, what percentage of the genset profile is life safety and what percentage is other? And my experience, the life safety uh, load for, say, a healthcare facility represents a pretty small percentage of its total uh, generation load, maybe uh, 10 to 12 percent. Um, then there's the critical branch, which together with life safety can maybe get to 25 or 30 percent of the total demand load on the generator. Um, it, but it varies. There's not a hard and fast percentage. Then beyond that, of course, the rest of the load would be typically be the equipment system, which would cover mostly environmental uh, things, HVAC, heating, uh, chillers, anything that's involved like that that we could possibly do without, at least for short periods of time. Okay, now the third part of this seems to be a little bit unrelated to that, but here goes. What is the typical size uh, in terms of percentage of the nameplate rating of the genset? What's the typical size of the first load step in NFPA 110 Level 1 Type 10 applications? And I have seen it. Uh, in Level 1 Type 10, again, it would describe a hospital requirement because I have to have life safety and critical on within 10 seconds, and it is a, uh, a, a life uh, it's important to, lot, to the safety of human life to have it come on quick. I've seen it go from, say, the life safety uh, branch to be the to maybe 10 or 12 percent to the life safety and critical, which might be 20 percent. But in multi-generator systems, I have seen the first load step be 100 percent of the first generator that came online. So it could go, it could be anywhere in there. It could go from almost zero to almost 100. So the answer is it depends. That's right. <laughs> Classic engineering answer. Now, Doug, the sec this next question goes to you, and it's kind of like in three parts, but uh, what are the typical reli reliability slash availability requirements that your customers ask for? And I'm thinking that the first part is in general, second part is how about military, and the third part is how about data centers? Okay, so as far as, you know, the reliability of systems, that usually drives us towards looking at 
what types of redundancies the uh, the different ownership groups want in their uh, standby power system. So we have to remember that the standby power system itself is the redundant source. So we have some owners who only request that we provide the code required uh, standby system in addition to the uh, normal utility system. But then we also have other institutional, uh, you know, healthcare, uh, healthcare clients or data center clients that want to take that to additional steps of redundancy. Um, when, when we talk about our data center clients, depending on what type of facility that we're looking at, whether we're talking about a tier one server room, all the way up to a mission critical data center that would be in the tier four range. Um, we've seen a lot of projects kind of hover in the tier two to tier three range, and, and those tiers have definitions uh, by a couple of different entities. Uptime Institute uh, is one that maybe people have heard of. Um, as to redundancy of path of circuits, redundancy of equipment, redundancy of transfer devices, all the way down to the redundancy of the power inputs into the utilization equipment, such as servers themselves. Once again, it's a true engineering answer that it depends um, based on the client and what their tolerance for risk is. But um, financial institutions and data centers, um, they actually kind of lean more towards the tier three or tier four range depending on, uh, depending on the application. Other commercial clients usually are somewhere between tier one and tier two as our healthcare. Thank you, Doug. And now, Tom, we have time for one more question, and it goes to you. Please explain the difference in emission requirements between diesel and gas turbine drivers for standby power. And part two, is there a response time difference between the two? And then what parameters indicate uh, whether it's diesel or gas turbine drivers for standby power? Uh, first, I will say that I'm not aware of specific differences in emission requirements between diesel and gas turbines. The the reason my thinking is that diesel is a comparatively compared to gas is pretty dirty. Uh, natural gas doesn't make much in the way of pollutants other than uh, uh, water and carbon dioxide, while diesel can leave a huge number of, of things that vary all the way from soot to oxides of nitrogen. So I'm not aware of what the uh, what the deal is, you know, what the, what's between that in terms of like EPA? Now, is there a response time between difference between them? Um, there seems to be that natural gas t seems to take longer and doesn't track its load as smoothly, especially under step changes as diesel does. Um, that's been what I've heard. I've never applied a natural gas generator. Most of my clients aren't really able to use that as their primary fuel. The last part of that question is what parameters indicate diesel or gas turbine driver for standby power. One of those might be how fast does it have to come up? Do I have an emergency component? Uh, do I have a small generator that I'm willing to use to meet 10 second rules and maybe use a larger generator for things that can be powered more slowly, uh, things that don't have rapidly changing loads where things don't drop on and off. Uh, Doug may know a little bit more about natural gas generators because his his clients may be using those. Doug, am I right about that? So we, you know, we've we've had some projects that have wanted to look at gas turbines, uh, whether they be in a in a cogen uh, arrangement or to try to use them for uh, the standby system. And we found that usually the 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 issue we have is if we're talking about a, a type 10 or needing to be up in 10 seconds, um, most gas turbines, depending on their size, cannot cannot achieve it in that time frame. So usually when you're talking about a backup system for your emergency and legally required standby loads, you're needing to use another fuel source such as diesel uh, to get that load up. Now you could soft transition in parallel with a uh, gas turbine, which we have done before, for extended outage periods. And basically your diesel generators would come online, you would get your load onto those diesel generators, spin up your turbine, and then do a uh, parallel transfer onto the turbine once it's up and running. And then you can shut your diesel generators down, and then you, you could burn a, a leaner, cleaner fuel for the longer duration. I'd like to close by thanking our great speakers, 
Douglas Lacey and Tom Devine for kindly sharing their time and their knowledge. I'd also like to extend a special thank you to our sponsors, ASCO, for supporting today's webcast. And now that we're just about done, we want your feedback. A short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as the webcast event ends. Please take a moment to complete it because we use this information to improve our webcast. Finally, on behalf of Consulting Specifying Engineer, Pure Power, and CFE Media, thanks for attending this event. This concludes our webcast. Thank you and goodbye.